All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the TF Tuesday podcast. My name is Zill. It's great to have you all back here again today. I got to say, uh, we had a random cold snap this past weekend, and I, for one, was living because it meant I could go for suiting outside. So um, yeah. I was very delighted by that change in the weather. Uh, I'm joined by my illustrious co-host, Calibra. How are you doing, Calibra? Doing pretty all right. Uh, my taste for indoor rock climbing has persisted. So I went yesterday, and now my forearms and gripping muscles and tendons are nice and sore for the next couple of days. Good. I mean, that's the, the feeling of the change, you know, working its way into you, right? Yep. Transformation is real. So it's making me a different kind of person and making me a different kind of body. I also got to actually finish the orange course that I was so desperately trying to do the first day that we got there. Oh, yes. The bouldering one, right? Yes. That orange bouldering course was really hard and I finally did it and I did it twice Turns out that one of the holds that we were using wasn't one mm -hmm. that was part of the path. So the first time I did it, and it was kind of illegitimate, even though it was still tough, Ugh. and I had to do it again to, <laughs> the, the right way, which was tougher, but yeah. I did it. And I'm like, okay, I did it. I did it slightly illegitimate, and I did it legit, and now, now I am pleased. Now there's new stuff to conquer. Yeah. Good, good. And of course, you know, if you're looking for new places to conquer, you can always join our uh, Patreon and uh, support us in our quest to continue conquering uh, the TF world, as it were. Uh, we have wonderful uh, little uh, tidbits you can get, uh, be it little outtakes from the shows or, you know, getting to ask Libra and I hard questions or just indulge in my love for Pool Toy TF. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah, I mean... Just, just remember, it's not a place for you to conquer. It's for you to help us conquer. It will fight back. We, we are, we are armed and ready. We have our own, <laughs> we have our own security. We have our own tactics. Oh, you will not defeat us. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Uh, well, yeah, um, I'm really excited for uh, today's episode. Um, and we have a very special guest joining us um, from the best country. Uh, so, Clow, I don't know if you wanted to introduce yourself. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Clow. I'm a Brazilian TF artist. So, yes, best country, currently hottest country. Please, someone save me. <laughs> yeah, once, uh, once America helps get its shit together to finally stop the heat from ramping up everywhere, You'll finally get what That'd you need. Nice. That that would be nice. Yay. Although I, I, I will say from my own experiences there, uh, it's kind of just hot all year round. But I imagine it's particularly bad right now. So yeah, and it's not even summer yet. We we just started spring. It's gonna be a rough year. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not gonna be great. I uh, the when I was last there, I went in December, which is uh, peak uh, of summer, yeah. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, very warm. So. <laughs> I do have to wonder, though, are you sure it's really the greatest nation on Earth? Because yes. we don't have the results for Mexico versus Portugal. Oh, it, he's talking about a Simpsons <laughs> reference. That's what he's talking uh, about. Uh, no, it's still, it's still Brazil, though. It's still Brazil. So. Yeah, we okay. may have lost that one game terribly to Germany, but it's still Brazil. Yes. Yes, we, we pretend it doesn't happen. It didn't happen. Yes. You know? uh, okay. Okay. I see how it is. Football is very important, except yes, it you is. can just kind of ignore results. So, whatever. Yes. That's how it works. Essentially, that's, yeah. Talk then to why a go football fan in Brazil. That's that's essentially the experience. Exactly. Then we, why we don't talk riot? about the, the disaster at Maracanã. Okay. We don't talk about that. That didn't happen. All right. Interesting uh, worlds to live in. Yes. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm really excited to have you on. Um, Longtime podcast listeners will know that uh, I very much sing Brazil's praises all the time, uh, given my own heritage. And so I'm very glad that we have uh, someone on from there. Um, and yes, Brazil. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm really excited to chat with you because um, I have I've come across your TF art. I, I came across it a little bit ago on Blue Sky and I was really intrigued by it, not only because of the style, but also because of some of the focuses that you have in terms of the things you draw. And one of the things that I found really striking about your gallery in general was the amount of like human and humanoid TF. And, you know, I think 
a lot of people, at least within like the transformation spaces I transit within, they often think about it as like a furry thing. Um, but your work definitely transcends just that. And so I was interested to hear more about how you got into doing like human and humanoid TF and how you've kind of felt creating them within very like furry focused spaces. Yes. So as I, I traveled, I guess, through uh, TF spaces, like discovering my interest in in the space, mm-hmm. in the topic, I I this I noticed that I tended to avoid feral TF mostly. Uh, I don't know why. I, it's just something that never really caught my attention. So I started looking for other stuff, and in DeviantArt mm-hmm. and and Tumblr and other spaces, I came to discover more literally just human tf where it's a person becoming mo- most times an, an archetype of a person most time is just is just a jock tf which i do enjoy quite a lot so yes. <laughs> that's mostly where i've i guess blossomed into my interest in tf so when i actually started drawing i wanted to draw what interested me and in part mm-hmm. what interested me interested me more was human tf character tf so I did, uh, I'm not going to say change a bit of my style. I did uh, play a bit more with Animal mm-hmm. TF and animal, animal Parts when I started posting to For, for Infinity because when I started actually drawing TF, I was only posting to For Infinity. I played a bit more with those aspects, but I, I was still just, most, my, most of my interest was on more of the humanoid part of the TFs. And it's just something that I, something something about it captures more of my intention when it's something becoming an, someone becoming an archetype of of a person or mm-hmm. not changing their species necessarily but changing i think we might talk about it later but changing their mind mostly and mm-hmm. changing their style and i also think like the reception has been very great in part because I think for Infinity uh, and the TF community in general is, and, and furry, the furry community in general is so open in, a, in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. So the reception has been great. And in part, I also think that TF is TF. And there there are a lot of already TFs uh, that are quite popular in furry spaces, like especially Mythical TF, Centaur TF, Satyr TF, mm-hmm. uh, Mer- Merman TF. Uh, even robot TF that I would classify as, depending of the design, of course, uh, that I would classify as more humanoid TF. Mm-hmm. So even if it's not uh, the main focus, I, I still think there's a lot of overlap there. And that's just, if it's an order becoming a robot or a guy becoming a robot, it's still transformation. It's still very much enjoyable. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. And I think that that's a really interesting way to kind of frame it in terms of, you know, these uh, like humanoids are almost like kind of bridging between like the furry and the human transformations because they still have some of those furry elements. Um, I, I'm, I've generally speaking, I am someone I found over like my time in transformation, I have started to lean a bit more towards the anthropomorphic TF um, and less of the feral TF. So I can definitely see kind of what might be underlying it but i guess uh, as like kind of a a follow-up question do you think that um because a lot of it has to come with like personality changes and mind changes and such i wonder if the like more human-esque sorts of transformations maybe you find them more interesting because there's still the ability to like communicate like verbally and um be able to kind of interact with social situations to like a degree do you think that plays at all into it I have to think about that a bit, but mm-hmm. generally, I don't particularly think so. Uh, okay. I think part of it is yes, uh, the that I guess it, it translates directly. Like if it's still a person, how they would interact with the world, uh, changing translates much more directly than if it were an anthro. But even in anthro, mm-hmm. Jeff, you can still have language and and speech changes so i don't think it's something that's uh exclusive to humanoid tf uh 
a part I, I think that is more prevalent in human ITF that I don't see as often, even in, in anthropomorphic TFs, is, I guess, style changes. Ah, yes. So, especially uh, clothing and demeanor changing. Uh, so, like, a guy becoming uh, what one could classically conceive of as, as a punk or a lord. And that type of dem demeanor changes, I think it's, to me at least, much easier to... to conceive that type of transformation when it's applied mm -hmm. to to a human yeah I, th I think that does make sense and it, it's interesting to kind of frame it that way because you're right especially when um when someone is doing more of like a human tf if all you see change is like maybe the clothes it doesn't necessarily imply as much of a tf so you almost have to have that sort of like you said the archetype of well now their personality has changed as well and they're acting in this different way and that communicates yeah. more of the transformation out so that that does make sense to me it, i hadn't thought about it that way yeah. though, so i find that quite interesting well it's kind of like if you want to imply that somebody was a thing but also have them be the animal you keep the hair so it makes sense to me if you want to express it by also changing clothes mm -hmm. yeah and I don't necessarily think that uh, like mental changes are a necessity for human TF too, because I also think a lot of people like to play with even in, in just archetype, the changing of the archetype of a person. If it it's still the same person, if they change their style, like from a straight laced mm -hmm. businessman, if some t if somehow they're now like uh, they look like a, a in hardcore punk, for example. How would mm -hmm. they deal with that? The, the, there's right. some some compelling stuff there too, and also like the lack of mental changes is something that I see more in when it, when applied to human TF specifically. It's something that I see more in in character TF too. So I think oh yeah, a lot of people just like conceiving uh, and thinking about oh I'm transforming into that character. Isn't that awesome? that I have now yeah. these powers or that strength or that look. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, one of the pieces that comes to mind, I know, for example, you did a few different um, uh, magical girl transformations, yes. which I thought were very interesting. And, uh, you know, again, it's like, oh, I, you know, n not necessarily much in the way of a mental change, but now you do have to like grapple with, well, now I look this way and, and whatnot. Um, and I think there was also, um, there was a, another example that now I'm forgetting, but um, I think you had done something on that kind of vein of, again, like, you know, you've become, uh, you've gone from being your normal self to now you are this character and you almost have to like figure out how do I even express myself now and like how different am I um I think uh, I remember now there was a it was a fire emblem transformation that's why it caught my eye I, oh. I really like fire emblem um it was um probably Dimitri I think it was from three houses yeah it was yes. Dimitri that's the one yeah <laughs> it was Dimitri from three houses and I was like oh that's interesting and there wasn't really as a you know as much in the way of like pr or projected like a personality change so it's like well how do you like deal with that now that you're Dimitri. <laughs> yeah, I also like uh, in for character TF specifically, a thing that I like playing with it that I think comes back a bit with the style change and all that is mm -hmm. like the clothes changing, even if it's yes. a, a, a terrible mess of a JR JRPG armor. I spent so long just trying to get it right, but it's. It's cool to see like regular clothes becoming armor, or mm -hmm. becoming this nonsense that uh, uh, was Nomura that like Nomura designed for a game for Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. Yes, I don't think I have done from Kingdom Hearts, but I have done like uh, a Malos from Xenoblade TF, and I believe Nomura was his character designer. Uh, hold on, you said Xenoblade, right? Yes. Xenoblade Chronicles. I'm gonna look that up right now. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles uh, art director. I remember the one you're talking about, by the way. That one was also quite well done. Uh, <laughs> the artist. I see. Can I send the an image of? Oh yeah, yeah sure absolutely. Uh, we'll put it on screen. These characters were designed by Nomura ah. for Xenoblade Two specifically. 
Oh, that's really cool. I can see it. God, even through the coloring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he went so off the rails. He's got a he's got a type. <laughs> he has a type, but he he he, he did the art for Parasite <laughs> Eve, and it was so good. It was. When when the brief calls for regular clothing, I think he can do it, but maybe he's past that now. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> if that's the case, it's been long past. For for context for you, uh, Libra, this is the the art that was done. Yeah, I see it. At least I didn't have to to do the chest armor. That yeah, one. I see the. Yeah. I see <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> it's really cool. I I think that like, especially with like depicting clothing changes. Um, it can be so challenging to get it right. So I think you really like settled on a good style in terms of showing the, in particular, like that middle uh, sort of area where like it's shifting from one to the other. Like, I think you've gotten that down like pretty well. That's very good to hear because it's often, especially with, the, with these more design, more complex designs, it's often not, <laughs> not an easy thing to get. Yeah, no, no, no kidding. Um, and I think it's it's admirable to like kind of tackle even like the the complex ones. And I mean, that's obviously how we we grow as artists, uh, you know, challenging ourselves and such. And one of the things I also noticed when it comes to like the more humanoid TFs that you do is that um, you've engaged with some like really unique ones. So obviously, I mentioned like the the magical boy girl transformations. Um, I saw you also had done like Octoling TF and like Clown TF and Human Pup TF. And so I was curious to know, like, when it comes to picking a humanoid change that you want to like create, what do you tend to look for in terms of inspiration or appeal? I think it's uh, in part when I draw something for myself. So mm -hmm. non commissioned stuff, I always try to look for, uh, I always try to do not just the obvious i guess mm -hmm. so if i'm one art I've, I've done is like a guy hoop tfing into a pool toy so i yes. i remember thinking okay I, I can do that just just straight him transforming into a pool toy version of himself mm -hmm. but then i'm like okay let's add a little bit more so he's now uh a jock version of himself he's the the team's mascot or yes. like when I wanted to do a similarly a, a pool toy like themed RPG transformation. Oh, we can make that a cr clown as well because a, a poofy clown. That's a fun idea. And so I regularly try to do something that's like a bit more than the obvious, I guess you could <laughs> say. But it's also just often that I I just get an idea uh, from inspiration somewhere and I just think huh that would be fun and I keep thinking about it keep thinking about it and I'm like I think I can make a TF a, a TF about that and it's not necessarily a, a human ITF but one I did recently that was a bit like that was my astronaut TF yes which uh, a game I'm I I play Sally. I'm playing a gacha game, and Sally, that game had a space-themed event, and the characters were wearing cute astronaut-based clothes. And I was like, "Oh, these clothes look cute. Let me try and do something maybe inspired about that." And was thinking about astronauts. And I was like, "Hmm, maybe we've seen armor TFs. Why not like an, an astronaut suit transformation?" Mm -hmm. And so. I think it's it, part of all that is like I I really try to I'm not going to say always at a twist but like not go for the most uh basic A to B. Always mm -hmm. there like there to be a little asterisk at the end. And you mentioned my my medical boys and they were specifically an idea I've always had like a lot of my inspiration comes from obviously anime and manga that Sally I, I don't really read much of anymore but mm -hmm. I've always like really loved the style and a lot of the the tropes you you find in 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 manga so catboys specifically are a thing I've very much have been fascinated by 
mm-hmm. so it's something that I, I often try to to draw when I'm just throwing an idea out and I think Catboy is even our like one of the things that got me into drawing TF because I was uh, I had looked for oh sorry my, my cat's playing a little bit I don't know if you got that oh all good okay. <laughs> uh, I've always uh, looked for Catboy TF in transformation spaces and the most are I got are more anthro cats which mm. are perfectly f- perfectly lovely I, I do very much enjoy anthro cat CF but it's not like the kimono bakimono yeah, yeah style of Catboy that I, I, I sought so it was very much a classic moment of Okay, I guess I got to do them. I get to do them myself. Yeah, and I <laughs> it was the Thanos moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I haven't stopped since. Good, good. Yeah, no, I think that's really. I I will agree. I think there's uh, not a lot of actual like cat boy TF um, sidebar. There's a patron in our server who's going to be delighted by this conversation. No. But anyways, um, I think there's not a lot of cat boy TF out there a lot of the time. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of funny to think about, especially given, you know, the, the furry nature of uh, fur affinity and what have you, you would think that would be something that uh, would crop up a bit more. But I guess for some furries, it's just like not enough and they just want to go the full way, which, you know, is fair. Um, but I mean, I definitely see the appeal in them. And I'm uh, glad that that's something you've been able to kind of do. I know, especially like when you, there was like a YCH, I think you did for some of those that also had like other kind of species, yes. but in that sort of kimono sort of style. Uh, so that was really kind of neat to see. And, uh, you know, we love a good magical boy girl transformation. So, <laughs> yeah, I am kind of in the same boat when it came to characters like Felicia, because as much as I like cat girls, she had just enough interesting things about her that um, I really didn't see done too much at the time and so you know I lean into other monster things but she's like this really definitive blend that people don't really go for because she wasn't an archetype that most people grew up with which is why I think that people will do the furry thing as anthro characters and not anything more or less it's got to be in that kind of spot you either look like robin hood or you look like or or something like that i don't know maybe you look like a street shark or a swat cat but like that's shit that people grew up with otherwise it's like eh, don't care yeah yeah and even felicia as an example and not to say that there's a lot more but in my searches I, i have found a lot more cat girl stuff even in about it so I, I was like no where's the the, the cute boys too <laughs> well it's not just it's not just cat boys i mean like the specific way she is oh, with like the big yes, claws yes. And no, like, no 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 but oh okay i i think we're also saying that it's even like there's a reduced amount of like cat girl cat boy stuff but even then there's more yes. cat girls than cat boys yes so yeah uh, there are more people coming out and accepting that they like cat boys and shit so it's it's got to be happening it's funny because in terms of gacha games i there is one that i play it's called zen the stone zero and there's like a cat boy character the that Wolfman. i was like the what Wolfman. yeah yeah, oh, Wolfman, yeah whatever anyway <laughs> I, 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 I was I like there's this guy that. with this cool shortened shield and i'm like oh he's a cat boy oh, okay that's neat you have a cat boy now i think his name is seth Zenless Zone Zero. His name is Seth. Oh no, he's cute. Oh, he's very cute. Okay, I'm gonna drop that in the. Chat yes. As well. Very good. Okay, yeah, uh, Your Honor, I would like to become him. Um, yeah, no, that's that's a very good design. It, I, it's funny. I I I know so shockingly little about the game other than it has the Wolf Man in it because obviously that was the thing that took over for the spaces. Yeah, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um well i you know i the one other thing i wanted to ask kind of in the realm of like human and human itf and as you said like we'll, we'll get to some of this later off obviously a lot of the times um you know human tf does get paired with a personality change and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way um and i think you kind of touched on this earlier but when you have like a human to human tf that um doesn't have a mental change associated um 
I think you've talked a little bit about like designing like some of the outfits and such, but what other things do you find interesting artistically when it comes to depicting that human to human change that doesn't necessarily have like a mental change associated with it? Mm. Personally, honestly, a lot of it is uh, the mental changes. I do really like mental changes. So it, for me specifically, if I'm just doing for myself a uh, human to human tab, I am looking for that mental change. But other than that, I do also just like uh, uh, portraying those more, I guess, basic transformations that are the spice you can add to anything. So I mm. think a classic is uh, muscle growth, okay. if it, I- even if it's not uh, hyper or even a style change not in the ch- change of clothes but like a more and it, it's this is something that i regret that i haven't done a lot of but like a more mm-hmm. realistic regular person becoming more toony and that kind of change is something that i uh, i i do find very compelling and even like something i think we we might discuss later too is uh mm-hmm. I guess uh, uh, material changes in a way, right? Yes. So becoming maybe made from a food or a different material, or even if it's not necessarily tough, like suiting too. It's something that I, I I like quite a lot, and could also be be thrown into the human TF pile, or human humanoid TF. No, that makes sense to me. I think um, I think the material stuff is is really fascinating as well. And I mean, as someone who's very into jock TF, uh, you know, very much a, a proponent of that muscle growth too. So yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, I, that very much makes makes sense to me too. And and you know, I, I think there's something really interesting too about, um, especially when it is like like you know potential size changes or stuff like that when you're doing a human to human tf that's the kind of like change that many people can actually kind of embark on in real life if they really wanted to and so it's it's one that i find interesting because of its accessibility in a sense when many transformations obviously are not and so i think the fact that you have kind of like taken that angle with some of your art i think uh speaks to like you know the the depth of the interest but also like the interest in some of the more like quote-unquote realistic stuff which again i feel like sometimes gets uh overlooked a little bit in furry spaces yeah for sure and it's it's fun there's a lot of that like parallel to transformation interests out out there one that Mm -hmm. you you got me thinking now about oh how we can like make our own muscle grow for weight gain <laughs> transformations yeah. happen even if it's it's sadly very slow slow burn tfs uh like there's also uh the i guess hair cutting community i guess you could say oh yes so like yes people that are, that are interested very much in like hair changes or 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 giving the control of your hair to someone else there's also the parallel there of like someone changing a very fundamental shape uh part of your shape mm-hmm. or your visu- visual presentation too i'd like to say yeah. that this hair cutting community thing has me as a fucking forever enemy don't ever touch my hair <laughs> <laughs> yes Ern Ern no. does not like his hair getting cut no. fucking break you <laughs> i i Get very much me. very much get that <laughs> i i will not give them any any power of my locks either but yeah I, i'm i'm in that boat too <laughs> um so uh, all three of us are no haircut club but <laughs> yes i i do think it's it's also really interesting and um very much an example of like that's something that can be extremely drastic and is a you know in, a, in its way own way a form of transformation so um yeah i definitely see why uh, those folks are into it and even like you know there's folks i know who are like really into like you know growing or like finding ways to grow their own body hair and like mm-hmm. that's something that also plays into a lot of this too so um yeah i, th- I think that especially with human to like human tf there's a lot more that is like interesting there that i think sometimes gets overlooked a lot and i find it really interesting when like artists choose to explore it so um yeah that definitely was something that stood out when 
um, I was starting to like get more familiar with your stuff. And I very much appreciate that that's the kind of focus that you've taken. I'm very glad to hear it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to kind of ask you about your approach to inanimate transformation because you have done some like really interesting ones that I haven't seen elsewhere. So you already mentioned like the spacesuit one. Um, there was also one into like a drink creature, which I thought was like really, really interesting from like a character design perspective. And like you've also done stuff with like Wiimotes and stuff. Again, things that I wouldn't necessarily think about when it comes to like inanimate transformation. So you know, when you think about some of those uh, transformations, what would you say was the pull towards those sort of unique and like out there ideas? I think um, there are two two pulls that brought me into mm -hmm. inanimate. Part of it is definitely in the artistic sense that it's just a. a, a a fun different way to render something to render a person in the terms of how to get uh, the sheen of metal and how that differentiates from skin in transformation and how to get that contrast or plastic mm -hmm. or latex and that I find very uh, it's very fun to figure out how to draw that stuff and mm -hmm. the other side of the answer is I just have a very deep interest in no stuff. So that lends itself very easily to inanimate stuff. So mm -hmm. poo toys and dolls and in general to like the, the shiny aesthetic, you could say. Yes, it's something that <laughs> I I find personally very attractive, and it's again just things I I try having fun with. So the Wiimote transformation, for example, it's I, I I don't even know how I got to that idea, but it's just something that I was like probably thinking about no stuff and not even just no bogus, but no in general, and I was like. Yeah, that'd be a fun way to take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I was delighted by it. I thought it was really interesting. And I will say, I think the like, focus on the the null bulge stuff really does come through uh, in, in a number of different pieces. I think um, this one with um, I think it was like, uh, two like lion uh, sort yes. of like jocks. Uh, that, I think that was actually the first piece I saw from you because it came across my feed as, as someone who you know, loves pool toys and, and loves latex stuff and bulges and all that wonderful good stuff. <laughs> um, so I think that was the first piece, actually, I saw that that very much caught my eye. And I think that that sort of fascination with like the the null bulge is um, always an interesting angle for me. I, I personally find it to be almost like gender affirming, um, given my own yes. sort of like non-binary identity. And I was curious to know if like you've made that connection to or if it's not connected or anything like that. I think there's definitely a connection there. It's not something that I, I can say I've placed too much thought on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because my own gender is something that I I don't often uh, touch uh, uh, upon with my own self for uh, several reasons but it's definitely something that I, I, I have connected and like hmm yes that does interest me and that does probably have something to do with uh, other parts of myself <laughs> yeah no that, that that makes sense and I think that's really cool um would you say that, um, particularly then, like outside of that, um, obviously, a lot of the times I think inanimate transformation will get brought up in the context of like BDSM spaces and such in terms of explaining what the draw is, you know, like, for example, with like the, the null bulges, it's like, oh, you can't necessarily like do much with it. There's like a restriction there and that sort of stuff. Um, how do you generally feel about uh, 
like that sort of comparison being made between inanimate and more of like the BDSM side. Is that something that you find resonates with you or is that something that you don't really think about or like find to be a connection that you relate to? Um, I think aesthetically, it's definitely something that I, I, I can see and appreciate the connection there because it's mm -hmm. very similar, especially when talking about uh, pool toys or latex suits and all that. And I also do very much see the, the, the parallels, right? In like yeah. transforming into a toy or literally being a toy in a scene or like the lack of control that inanimate often brings mm -hmm. uh, that also is uh, visible in some BDSM stuff. But personally, it's not something I, I seek out like the experience I can see at least, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, uh, not that I think there's anything wrong with it or anything. It's just like, for me, I, I like it to stay at the aesthetic side personally. Yeah. But yes, I definitely see, do see the parallels. I think it's, uh, oftentimes I do get a lot of inspiration from some BDM, BDM st BDSM stuff that I see because sometimes there are these fantastic suits or toys that people make and I'm like whoa this is beautiful yes and <laughs> it's something that's very fun to then get in my head and, and play around with for how to use that in, in transformation and that's something that's even something that, uh, that I like to play around a bit in some some of my inanimate stuff and that I also see very often in BDSM is like a uh, not mm -hmm. necessarily bow, uh, bow, um, no bow, just but no like faces and depersonalization. Yes, and that's also something that I I I see a lot of in in both areas. That's very fun to play with for me. Yeah, no, I I tend to really enjoy that stuff too. Um, and I think in some ways the stuff related to the null faces puts even more of an emphasis on like the disconnect from being like a quote unquote person yes. and the almost like anonymization of the person as well and how that can then like feed into someone's enjoyment of a of a scenario um and i think that that sort of angle is always one i'm i'm interested to hear when it comes up because i find that especially like with a lot of folks in transformation spaces um, they like to have, at least have some sort of either like identifier once they're like they've changed or if it's to like a creature, you know, there's something like distinct about the creature itself. So yes. the pull towards like the more like anonymization, I always find interesting because it, it's definitely something I see a lot more now, but especially back in the day, I didn't see much of it in the slightest. And so it's always like hardening, I guess, <laughs> to, to hear other people talk about it in that way too. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely something that I, I like very much thinking about. Even if if it's not even an inanimate TF phone, or, but like something that I've something that I've talked with some mm -hmm. friends about is even like uh, generic right. grunt transformation. Be it right. like uh, on more of a drone sense, or even a, a character transformation like a nameless rocket grunt. I think it right. has a very fun flavor and, and and appeal as a transformation mm -hmm. and it, it it oh yeah it very much touches on like the something that i th think we might talk about uh when we get to mental change change stuff but like the relief i guess of uh not necessarily being controlled but like not having to be a, a person mm -hmm. yeah almost like being able to let something else kind of like take the reins. drive things yeah take the reins yeah. and not have like a, a a particular difficult uh rain taking either it's like you know you just kind of do one or two things and that's kind of it exactly a vacation from being responsible <laughs> very much so yes yeah, that's <laughs> what i thought yeah um 
Well, yeah, I, I guess then um, the other question I had related to inanimate transformations in terms of your work is that sort of texture focus, because I think you play into that a lot with many of the pieces. And um, that change in texture is often a very big draw, you know, being like, you know, the, the wetness of a liquid or the smoothness of latex or the cool feel of metal. And so I, I we've kind of talked about it a little bit already, but I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you find texture impacts your enjoyment in an inanimate TF. Yes. So for texture, there there is the artistic side that I think uh, I've already touched on that it's mm -hmm. uh, something that I found has TF in general has really broadened my horizons, I guess, as an artist has really helped me get more uh, consistent in drawing, mm -hmm. drawing faster, drawing better stuff, not even just TF, but like getting better anatomy. And for the textures, it has been very like I have improved in strides, I feel, on how to to render different stuff, even if my style is decently simple and I'm not getting like mm -hmm. um, the threads of a cloth rendered. But like to a distinct thread from fur, from plastic, from latex, from metal, it has been a very fun exploration in that. But another as aspect that i do really like a lot in in that side of an animate transformation is how i i personally imagine it would feel to have that change occur mm -hmm. and ha to have like that body part be that different uh texture or material so for, for like metal stuff like how that would change like it would be much more rigid. Would it be cold? Would it be like thinking about like a uh, very reflective metal fogging up because it's mm -hmm. close to like something humid or or latex? Like I think a lot of uh, latex suit pool toy people uh, quite enjoy the squeakiness aspect. So oh, yeah. that's something that I I really enjoy thinking about and, and imagining how that would feel and like how that would compress under f under the f fingers or even like for liquid and that Jeff uh, that it's not even Jeff but that character in particular the my drink boy has both the aspect of I want to draw something artistically n new in a sense because mm -hmm. for that one specifically I really wanted to like think okay how can i really present this as a hot summer day and this liquid guy is shining and shimmering and you just know he's very refreshing but also like that part of thinking oh being a very uh a, a, a slime liquid body how that would feel when it's very hot and like if it would be almost as if a glass in shape of a of a of a person like mm -hmm. with the the <laughs> sorry the like perspiration of the glass in a very hot day right cuz yeah yeah they're so cold inside and all that and just thinking about how that would would be like in both the aesthetic part and the uh, physical, textural feeling part is something that very much appeals to me. Yeah, you keep you mm. keep bringing up texture. So texture is pretty much the visual thing that you like to use in order to impress the experience on yourself. Uh, because like because because like okay, well, first of all, I guess I would have to wonder when you do transformation stuff. Is it something that you like to put yourself in the situation for others, mix of both, or leaning on more than one or the other? Uh, I think I tend to lean more on uh, imparting on myself, but that's something that I don't really like to portray in my art for several reasons, but in general, just uh, like things about self-presentation i'm not yeah yeah that's that's fine but that's that's not 
necessarily what I want to get into right now. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is like you bring up texture a lot. And so I was wondering if the interest is in you changing and being able to express this texture visually, if it adds sizably to the experience. Because I do think inherently that if you want different materials to get the look across, to get the feel across for people, like, yeah, that's a thing. But to but to focus specifically on the different uh, looks that give you the impression of, is this hard? Is this soft? Is this attractive? Is this, re- is this supposed to repel? You know, that's that's something that I don't really hear people bring up specifically. And I was wondering if the reason that it's a big thing for you is because it really helps you get into the situation or the scenario. I think part of it it is probably that that I, I when thinking about the transformation, I, I like think about what that would feel like on my own. But it's not so. But like transformations are not something that I usually like to think of uh, myself undergoing. If that makes sense, I just would mm-hmm. like I just generally think about how. Uh, well, that's fine because you you, you you would be feeling yes. it if you you would also be feeling it if it's something that like if it was like a partner or something, and you mm-hmm. think about that too because I think about textures of things as well, yes. and that's why I like the like rippling muscle, flesh, bone thing, it's its own kind of sensation that I want to portray and that I would want to feel, Mm -hmm. not necessarily in myself, but in the partner that I have, because that's more where I lean in terms of the fantasy. Yes, Uh, I think I I, I, I got it, fully understood the question now. And yes, it's uh, the change in texture and the feel of texture is definitely something that I I like to portray because it is something that I, it's that I look to, that I mm-hmm. like focusing on when thinking of these scenarios in my own head. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really cool. And in particular, I think the, the drink character, I, I kind of how you described how he's supposed to kind of come off. I mean, I definitely get that impression from, from the art of him. And I think the like design really has mapped kind of the one-to-one of the drink to like a kind of anthropomorphic form over quite nicely and i think to libra's point i think that focus on the the texture is definitely something that not only did it come out when i was first looking at um your artwork but i think it also is something that leaves a lasting uh impression and so um you know that focus definitely is born from a, an innate interest as kind of you spoken to here yes <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, I did also want to get into some of the personality and mental changes because we've we've kind of brought it up already, I think, indirectly in the first two sorts of topics. But um, it's definitely something that plays into a lot of your art pieces as well. And I was curious to get a sense as to um, how you sort of approach them and what things you feel make a mental TF satisfying for viewers to see. Yes. Um for things that I, I search for when drawing is very it's very much like the the change in especially in, in visual art it's the change mm-hmm. in like body language and how can I communicate that change in even if there are no text bubbles how can I right. portray that character as more guarded or more open or more cocky and I think it's also very fun to uh, play with, if it's a sequence, mm-hmm. how that change comes about. If I, I think most of the time I usually do like a moment of, I, I guess, confusion in the middle uh, where the change is ongoing, but also how like, especially if it's uh, more of a shyer person becoming more outgoing, for example, mm-hmm. how that, how can I portray that literally? So I think even in the the, the sequence of the drink, uh, drink guy, yeah. with the muscle muscle growth, I think that one was something that I went to, that I wanted to play with, and the commissioner wanted to play with, like a, a shy guy becoming that jock type. Yes. So. The change in posture, the change in, in when there are speech bubbles, 
the change in speech patterns. So uh, I think it's something that's uh, very seeable in like um, I think in some some of my Pokemon sequences, but even in some of the uh, character transformations or or some one of the, my doll transformations. Like the mm -hmm. change in, in in speech and speech patterns is something that I I I really like in, mm -hmm. in general. I, I look forward to try trying to portray. So when uh, when a person becomes like stuck in that new way of s saying things, if in, in the classical jock transformation when they can't stop saying bro and adding bro to their uh their phrases and even for for cat boys something that mm -hmm. really stuck with me i think that it's uh f i first discovered it through the the writer abikyo i'm not okay. sure how to pronounce their name mm -hmm. but like they do a lot of speech fucking stuff so they have a couple of stories with cat boys and cat girls where they get stuck saying like nya or dayo and other uh classical shonen character type stuff yes. and it it really stuck with me and it's something that I really like to get across when I do a transformation with with uh speech cha with uh mental changes like how then that that mental transformation would come across for the char that character's speech, their demeanor, and mm -hmm. their posture too, but also coming back to like style, how it changes their their clothes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I think the the changing speech patterns is always something that I enjoy, and you know the sort of classic approach of you know you start off with like one kind of like font and, and color to your speech that transitions into the other as the words are also changing I think like that's always a very good little shorthand um I mean you know even to use like a recent example I know you did a junk rat tf and like that obviously has that sort yeah of, like, integrated in as well and that's a great way to kind of show that uh, to the audience visually that there has been that sort of a change and um that the personality is shifting as well um I, I was curious to ask though are there any sort of like mental changes that you don't like to explore when you're doing sort of like personality changes or mental changes or anything like that yes um uh, in general i think this doesn't apply specifically to mental changes but in general i'm i'm not a big fan of like bad end stuff mm -hmm. so when the changes uh bring about something more negative i don't usually like them uh, there's a, I, I, it's kind of a, a, a trend on the transformation spaces in Tumblr right now that's something I, I don't really like because there's a lot of uh, gay to straight transformation and that's a type mm -hmm. of mental transformation that I, I really don't enjoy especially because it's, it's uh, oftentimes tied to a more uh, to conservative conservative uh, conservative transformation yeah yes yeah so like a person becoming more right wing and it's especially with a lot of the current political stuff it's not something that i i like playing with it's not something i, I mm -hmm. even feel comfortable really seeing much of around i yeah. can understand why people like them but it's I, i'm not really gonna touch them if i if i like for example if i would do a a, a cop transformation someday because like I, the change of clothes the uniform these are things that appeal to me I would not mm -hmm. do like just a, a straight cop transformation it would be like a cop mascot or I would have to do a, a twist to it for it not to be to carry the bad feelings I guess that that come with yeah. a lot of that stuff yeah, no, I think that makes sense. It, it's interesting. I Maybe this is because I don't transit a lot on Tumblr anymore, um, but I'm surprised to hear that that's like the almost like conservative TF is something that's been 
going around on there um i i almost feel very like insulated to be i'm like what that's a thing that's going on right now yeah um but <laughs> um yeah i mean i i am definitely on the same page there that's not something that uh i find interesting and again i know there are people who who do but um I mean, I, I disagree with them fundamentally on that front, but yes. uh, that's a whole other and conversation. Like, so, <laughs> just like a, a disclaimer, because I don't, because I just have the Gator Straight tag uh, blocked, so I do ah, not read gotcha. much of the, those stories. But I remember when I first stumbled on a couple of those, they really did focus on like the conservative aspect of those. So I don't know if mm. these stories are now uh, better. <laughs> In that sense, I guess I would say, if they are great, I'm not reading them to to discover it, to find out. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's entirely fair, and it, I, it's something we've said on our podcast many times too. In the sense of like, it's good when people know their boundaries, and it's like that's not something that interests me. And I'm yeah, good. It's good to separate yourself from that kind of a thing. So hey, it's just a, another mark of their insecurity that the people they want to fuck aren't at aren't accessible to them i jokingly yeah. say thing i jokingly say my only problem with lesbians is that i don't have a chance with them but like <laughs> it, it's it's more like because i'm be like damn she's hot oh she's not in the guys well well disappointment but like that's not a hugely serious thing for me but because conservatives and fascists and you know, they're often the same thing, or at least enabling fascism. You know, they're all, like, very sexually frustrated people who just uh, can't accept denial or themselves. And it makes a lot of yes. sense that gay to straight would be, like, their kink. It's it's in the it's in the same vein as, like, mixed race fucking or something like that for them, where that's their taboo, so they'll indulge in it and be really ashamed about it, and then also just make all the laws to make sure that those people, you know, don't get to live. Yeah. 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 Uh, and goodness knows we've <laughs> seen enough of that rising tide around the world in many different countries. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree there. Um, On to better I topics, then, like, I, I hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I guess in terms of, like, some of the... In mental changes you have depicted i know like sometimes it can be more of like a submissive or subservient uh sort of angle or it can range into like more empowering um and i guess i was curious like in terms of like both of those ends of the spectrum is there one side that you find yourself more drawn towards and if so i'd be curious to hear why uh yes for sure and it's definitely more of the submissive side mm -hmm. and i think Genuinely, a lot of big part of the reason is that I just really like the aesthetic of like Butler stuff. Ah, okay. So, and, it, it, and it's something that I have drawn several times, and I think it harkens back to what we've talked about of, of letting someone take the reins and and think for you, and you don't really have to worry about. Uh, about too much and I think even mm -hmm. I, uh, I thought I was thinking about it early, early today and I think it has a little bit about uh, in common with that meme I don't know if I'll find it but of like it's just text, me text messages and it's person A asking oh have you seen that issue and person B is like oh don't worry about it kitten and person A is like okay yay and that's basically how, how I, I like to think about it. And like for butlers in particular, I think it's just a, a fascination I've had for a, v a very long time of just like the look, right? Especially mm -hmm. in, in fiction with uh, the, I guess, hyper competent butler trope t or maid with like... Uh, the butler from ba Black Butler or yes. Sakuya from Toho that are like perfectly poised, extremely elegant, very powerful, but they're in a, in a position of serving another that they mm -hmm. like by choice and they're, they're, they like that. So that kind of stuff really appeals to me, that kind of strength mixed with submissiveness. 
Yeah, no, I think that's that makes uh, sense to me, and I think it's interesting to kind of have that. Um, there's all uh, that focus on the like willing, uh, I guess, uh, giving up of the like control, so to speak, combined with looking aesthetically pleasing, um, almost for others more than for oneself. Um, in in some ways, there is some like elements of like objectifying yourself, which I think ties back to some of the themes we were talking about earlier. And I always think that that's kind of an interesting kind of angle when folk, people focus on that kind of end of the spectrum. I think it's it's more prevalent in these spaces uh, to like focus on that end, but I think people come at it from very different angles. And I think that one is one that I find very interesting too, the idea of like, um, you know, putting someone on display in a way while they're still, they still are like a, a person at the end of the day. Yes, I don't... <laughs> This is kind of like the more typical angle I see this stuff at maids, butlers, they're at your service. When when I don't really see that as a submissive thing, if you're talking about power and being distinguished and being put together and being somebody who is very capable, I would think that somebody is choosing to do that out of loyalty and less out of submission. And you could conflate the two, but I think there is a clear distinction. And there are it's, two different kinds of ways of going about it that I have seen. And people do love, love the maid butler thing because it very strongly implies they will do anything you want, anytime you want it, no matter what, because you're in charge. But I don't like that because it comes off as like, it, 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 it displays to me as like a form of wanting to own somebody. And I don't ever want to be in that position and vice versa one won't put anybody in that position so like when you're talking about characters like uh the one in ba black butler or fucking alfred alfred is somebody who would you know live and die for uh for bruce uh and or batman depending on how pedantic you want to be about it except he's not submissive he definitely pushes back he definitely gives his opinion and will tell him do not do this it will hurt you it will hurt me it will hurt your family it will hurt the legacy of your parents and it's really not about being submissive as much as it is being loyal your interests are in taking care of the person even if you don't agree with them so i'm wondering if that figures into it or do you really look for the submissive angle overall i think in part it definitely does but it's uh but i think it's more toward the submissive angle for example i have uh but it's but I, I i agree there is that like power imbalance that comes in with a lot of submissive mental changes and like the owning aspect of a butler uh it's not something i, I often <laughs> think about because with a lot of transformation personally i i don't often think of like what's around the tf because uh oftentimes if i do i get sad <laughs> um but i i think it's definitely more of the submissive aspect for me for example i have a, 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 a some stories over on gay spiral stories which is an, a, a website focused on gay mental changes uh there's this author that i really enjoy uh happy endings and they've done some very great butler stuff but it's definitely focused on well they do a lot of <laughs> like personal betterment stories which i do enjoy yeah. quite a lot but they also do a lot of like poised butler stuff that's very much in the sense of submission in the sense of, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, okay, I have become this person that has to be on time, has to clean everything to perfection, and has and has to be perfectly poised and and elegant while doing so. And they do like to play play a bit with power dynamics, but uh, mm -hmm. what brings me more to the table is more of the aesthetic side and the submission obedience side. Got it. Yeah, I think there's still something to be said about um, 
the like being put on display angle and there's like a i think a, an element of like exhibitionism that comes into play too in yes, terms of like definitely. admiring someone in that kind of sense and wanting to be admired in that way and um you know i think that in particular when it comes to transformation it's interesting to see that mapped not always just onto like object tf but also into like the personal angle of like yes i you know i look this certain way now and i want people to like see me and admire me for whoever it is that i have now become um i think that again that's something that i think comes up a little less often in these conversations so when it is mapped onto like a, a mental changer like human tf i always find that um something interesting to kind of dig into yes uh, i i like to think it sometimes as like uh like a, a drone transformation but with like 10 20 percent more more agency or personality i guess because yes. <laughs> because drone transformations yeah. are also in the sub submissive spectrum something mm -hmm. that i do enjoy quite a lot like we, we talked about yeah depersonalization and all, and all that and it, it is uh very attractive to me yeah no, I, I'm I'm a fan of drone TF too. So uh, I can see the appeal of like, okay, what if you just got like just twenty percent more uh, agency still, but you know, still in that kind of mindset. I I definitely think that's an interesting kind of balance to strike. Yeah. Uh, I guess the last question I kind of had on like personality changes, um, and I I mentioned this because you know we talked a little bit about. Uh, you know, how some of like these changes we've been talking about are actually like somewhat accessible from like a real life experiencing sort of perspective. Are there any personality changes that you yourself would want to undergo in real life? Uh, yes, for sure. There are a, a couple times that I like keep thinking to myself, okay, I got to do this more, this more. And there are kind of like a two opposite sides of the spectrum, I guess. Mm -hmm. But on, on one hand, I w I'd like to be more, like, diligent with the things that I want to make. I want to uh, procrastinate more, be more focused. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, even if I, uh, uh, I have played a bit with Hypno, never really, really got anywhere, but this is something that yeah. I've uh, tried looking for files on. Uh, to get more focus to get like more uh, yeah just get more focus I think it's the best way to, d to define it mm. uh, ironically Twitter being blocked helped a lot on that aspect um, <laughs> but on the other side of, of the spectrum I also would like to get more chill to be less uh, in my head about some of my insecurity some of my worries and be more like gung-ho i guess mm -hmm. in general so these are <laughs> both i guess the uh worker bee and the stoner i guess yeah <laughs> mindsets <laughs> uh are, are both attractive to me in that way they're both something that i i strive a bit <laughs> in my yeah. life I, th I mean i think both of those also make sense in the sense that you know especially as like I personally I mean I have ADHD so I fully can see the appeal of like being able to focus more on the things that perhaps you should be focusing on in one way or another and um the idea of also like you know like having less background anxiety or like wanting to be more chill like these are all things that I think many people can like connect to so yes uh it doesn't surprise me um, I, I was interested to ask the question primarily because again, as we mentioned earlier, I'm definitely someone who's into like jock transformation, so to speak. And there's some like interesting sort of like mental aspects you can play with as well that I think like I personally am trying to like shuffle through right now. Um, but I, I always find those kind of interesting because as you said, like be it through like, you know, making concerted efforts or, you know, something more drastic like hypno, these are things that we can actually like experience in real life. And so uh, when someone focuses on them in their art, I'm always like curious to be like, but are there any you would want to do? You know, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As I said, like the more extreme stuff, it's not something that I, uh, I, I, I try in my real life. Cause when I think mm -hmm. about the, about it, I get, <laughs> 
when I think about the consequences of transformation, I, I guess uh, I get sad oftentimes. Yeah. <laughs> but even like the more out there impossible transformations, like the mythical transformations uh, or mm. more inanimate stuff, I I don't know what it is, but it, I think it has something to do with like even horror. It's not something that I I really like uh, a, as a genre. So yeah. it's something where thinking about the consequences of transformation and how that would impact other people and uh, of more uh, hardcore transformations of how that would impact other people in the person's life or themselves and their livelihood. I'm like, mm, that's something I, 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 not something I really, really enjoy thinking about, but definitely the more, uh, I, I guess, lateral moves of yeah. what we can actually do and achieve in real life. It's, it's very fun to think about. It's very, you aim for empowerment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, one thing we've kind of, I mean, we started off kind of with at the top of the episode, but <laughs> yeah. obviously as, you know, an artist from Brazil, I was curious Vai to Brasil! hear a little bit. Exactly. Um, I was curious to hear a bit more about like what it's been like interacting with like the Anglosphere online in relation to transformation and how that might compare to like TF stuff within like the Lusophone speaking sphere. Cause I, you know, I, I'm not going to make anyone sit through my terrible broken Portuguese, but, um, you know, I, I don't tend to interact with it too much. Um, and I haven't seen that much online. So I was curious to hear what your experience has been like, both on like interacting with a lot of Anglos online and also like how that contrasts to like the Brazilian perspective. Yes. Um, uh, so to answer this first, uh, as a small disclaimer that like a lot of what I personally seek to interact online is in general already in, in English mm, uh, okay. in, in general because there is more of a community I guess for lots of gen for any interest I guess you could have there's already a community there oftentimes and it's already in English right so having th said that I haven't really found a lot of uh, TEF community in Portuguese. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there is a, a furry community here in Brazil. Yes. I'm not sure how tuned to TF uh, a lot of it is. I haven't been I haven't had the pleasure of going to cons. I don't know if mm. I would because uh, currently at least for me the separation of like uh, my uh, IRL stuff and the TF space is very important. I might go in the future. I, I'm sure it would be a lovely time. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really seen a lot of transformation stuff, uh, even on the, the bigger sites in Portuguese. Uh, I have mm -hmm. seen a couple other artists in that post in Portuguese that, uh, but it's not, not often. It's maybe a, a post here and there, or they, they just have on their profile that they are Brazilian or I guess Portuguese. I have seen many more Brazilians than, than Portuguese yeah. furries, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of it is, uh, it's not even that there isn't an interest mm -hmm. here. Uh, Cause for example, a, a big reason of why I actually draw TF is cause I found a very good friend of mine event, uh, in real life, I guess. And we found that we share the interest in transformation and he eventually pushed me mm -hmm. to start posting, to start drawing, uh, on that interest. So I'm very sure that there is a lot of people with the transformation interest in Brazil. It's just mm -hmm. that I guess you could say it's uh, in a sense, a niche of a niche. And yeah, it being not that big a community, I think it's harder for it to uh, develop. Uh, I, I I guess I don't necessarily want to say these local scenes, but like uh, 
especially online, which is mm -hmm. where I interact with transformation, it's harder for these smaller bubbles to be seen. Yeah. No, I think that that makes sense to me, um, you know, especially because like so much of the Internet is in English. It's not necessarily surprising that, you know, that since it dominates the conversation, there's not necessarily as much in, you know, necessarily like Portuguese or what have you. And then, you know, because there's a more limited pool of people who are potentially like interacting in that language, then also finding people who are then into that niche of a niche. Um, although I got to say, it, it's very cool that um, you kind of were kind of encouraged to share your art online because of like an in-person sort of friendship that you had. Um, I I, th I find that really interesting. And that actually kind of reminds me of, I, I know you've told the story before, Libra, about like, you know, your interactions with your friend who also was into transformation and uh, like being shocked that he was also into it because it wasn't something that had come up before. And I, I always find those sorts of dynamics to be really like cosmic almost in terms of like the, you know, the, <laughs> yes. the coincidence. Yeah, but you can only really <laughs> get that if you decide to test people and, and tell them about yeah. it. Yeah. You can't, you can't have a, you can't really get it both ways where you happen to fumble across that. It's like super low odds that you're going to consistently get into somebody's conversation of that kind of fantasy or mm -hmm. interest. So, it, yeah, like if you really want to know, or if you really want to expand on that with like somebody else, yeah, you got to talk to people about it somehow, which is yeah. what I have done many times, and I'm going to keep doing it eventually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, but yeah, I think it... Sorry, no, go ahead. No, no yeah, and it's, it's definitely something that has... Uh, on my side, at least, it, it's something that requires, like, courage to bring up. Because even in in, mm -hmm. in the case of this friend, it, uh, it's something that we... Like, we, we, we met on Tinder. We were already, already at the time, uh, thinking... Uh, meeting on the basis of the expectation of, like, a relationship, right? So mm -hmm. even then, I was I was still scared of bringing up the topic. So it was such a a, a nice coincidence when I, I don't even remember what brought the topic up, but when we discovered that we both shared this interest, and it it eventually evolved for me currently at least on such a big part of my life, such a, a big interest to share online. Yeah. No, I think that's. Uh legal as they would say yeah. uh and um <laughs> you know i i think i think it's really cool that that's uh and again like that you had the courage to to like kind of engage with it and to like have such a positive reception so um it's it's really cool to see that that's something that like has affected the trajectory of things so much um I guess the other thing I would want to ask on in terms of your perspective is, of course, the other big thing that's changing a lot of trajectories for a lot of Brazilian artists, artists with Twitter or whatever you want to call it, getting shut down. Um, and I was curious to hear how like that sort of element of things has affected you and what your general thoughts are on like what can be done to support Brazilian artists as like this situation continues. Yes. Um... Well, to start, I think it's now it's a great opportunity to have a Portuguese speaking TF community arise since the place where a lot of us are now, like uh, Blue Sky is mm -hmm. so dense with Brazilians. Me uh, uma mensagem, galera, bora conversar. So I personally w was very lucky on the artist side at least that I had not yet I guess set up a Twitter I mm -hmm. wasn't really interested in doing so very much in part because of like the administration of the site I yeah. uh, I did have a personal Twitter that is now locked as wi with how many Brazilians decided to deal with it uh, yeah. but Personally, I think the biggest uh, thing that I miss, and I know a lot of my friends miss too, is being able to see uh, artists that we like or interact with uh, like YouTube personalities that we like and seeing, I guess, the outside 
uh, perspective. That because the places that we've moved to are, uh, mm -hmm. as as we mentioned, it's so dense with Brazilians. So that's something that I miss. I miss s several of the artists that I followed that weren't Brazilian, yeah. so they had no reason to to move with us. So they are only on either Twitter or maybe Instagram and personally instagram is shit so yeah. fight me on that no, it's, <laughs> <true>. <laughs> it's just true <laughs> uh so uh, that's that's another place that i'm not touching with a ton football so i uh, i'm very sad at all the these people that sure i didn't really interact with them but that i enjoyed seeing their work cross my dash that i don't have for that that experience anymore mm -hmm. but as I said, it's not really that much of a big deal because my following wasn't there. My following is on right. For Infinity on, and Blue Sky. Uh, so I really feel bad for all of the Brazilian artists that did build a following on Twitter. Uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, talking about how they lost contact with the commissioner or they just their number of followers has dropped drastically because of course they're restarting on a, a new on a new platform yeah. be it uh sadly for them instagram or or blue sky or threads uh like the brazilian internet is also not centralized yet mm -hmm. um so even if it's another Brazilian artist, it's uh, it's somehow we we've also lost that con that connection. Yeah. But uh, yeah, all of the uh, these artists they lost their following, they lost their source of income. So if it's something that I can say of like how to help these artists, a lot of them their last posts on Twitter, like probably last five posts, have been okay. This is where to find me. So if you have mm -hmm. noticed that any artist uh, y that you liked, that you knew w was Brazilian or you had an inkling or they just have been quiet for a while and they haven't posted, check them out. Check if their twin post is links elsewhere. They might be mm -hmm. active on Blue Sky, on Threads, on Instagram, maybe even, even on Tumblr. Uh, go check them out. Go follow th them back. Uh, Create an op take this as an opportunity to also get off Twitter. I know that I have been <laughs> enjoying that uh, <laughs> aspect of the these complications at least. Um, yeah. Do that. Go follow them back. If you were commissioning someone that has not responded, it might be because they were Brazilian. Try to contact them elsewhere. Uh, I know it's something that can be very stressful. <laughs> Um, yeah. and it's uh, I guess leaving a bit of the um, the Brazilian artist perspective aside let me think I have if I have uh, anything else I would say that uh, because before I move on cause I have a little mm -hmm. um, no yeah it's mostly that though th Follow people elsewhere. Go yeah. track them down. They will appreciate it. And yeah. uh, on my perspective, a bit like, but less related to the goings on on Twitter itself. Mm -hmm. It has been a bit, uh, I guess, s sad for me because it's uh, both with Twitter going down and with the hijacking of her affinity a couple weeks back yes it's been to me personally a very clear kind of wake-up call of like we always hear oh what's on the internet is forever and it's i've been and i've m been maybe uh what's the word uh innocent to the truth i guess it's what i'm saying naive yeah yeah naive yeah, yeah. Uh, in when I believe that because no a lot of these connections that we have like even if it's not an, an artist talking to 
the public, like friends that people have made through Twitter or people that I was talking on, on for affinity. These connections are so fragile through the internet and it's been something that's been on my mind with both of these occurrences, I guess, on the web going on. Because it's, yeah. it's weird thinking about how, I guess, I guess there, there are pal- parallels to mortality, but I don't think it's as grandiose as that. It's just weird to think about how finite and out of our own control these connections that we have are. And these these audiences that we have are because as we saw in for, for affinity all it takes is in some cases is just one crazy person to take it all down for a couple yeah. of days and you lose like maybe you you miss the chance to respond to someone and that, that's that's it and well, aside uh, from the obvious problems with centralizing things, which is part of why yeah. these concerns are even being talked about, it is convenient to have a place where you know where most people go to. Uh, but there does have to be... The other part of the internet that I think a lot of people miss has to do with the willingness and ability to find things and to stumble across things. Uh, the stuff isn't permanent because people aren't permanent and things change. So things go away. It's not really, it, it's, it's nothing to get really philosophical over. It's just kind of how things are. Uh, things don't last, good or bad. But the thing that can remain is the intent to seek people out. Like you said, you seek mm-hmm. these people out, they'll feel happy about it because they want to be found. I mean, it's clear. Just um, if, if you are concerned with how tenuous a connection can be with people, uh, that's also a little normal but if you're concerned about maintaining that connection that is a kind of lead work that people kind of have to do their on their own you can't be in connection with everybody all the time and you will not always have the connection but if you value certain people yeah reach out make sure that you have them in mind and that you are able to find them if things change and all that kind of stuff because that's just how it is it yeah. It's how it is if you well, got to move somewhere or you are forced to move somewhere. I think it's also just a, a wake-up call reminder in the sense of I think a lot of folks, especially like more recently, I think things like Twitter and such felt a lot more stable. And as we have now seen, those things are not and probably haven't been for, for a, a, a hot minute now. Um, and that's come from things that perhaps were more obvious to not be stable with Twitter (laughs) and then things that perhaps they were less obvious to not be stable, like for affinity. And so, you know, I I think one of the other points to build off what you both said is that, um, especially back in the olden days, you know, like there was a lot of websites that would like kind of build up and then die and there wouldn't necessarily be records of them and what have you. And it felt especially as we moved into like more like the web 2.0 of the internet, it felt like things were a bit more stable and archivable and that has just been proven to not be true. And so when we think about our spaces are not our really our own, um, I think it's important to remember that, um, you know, as you said, Libra, like making those connections, if you value them, you have to put in that extra effort to try and track them down. And, as you said, Clow, like there's a lot of folks who now are, have been scattered to the wind and are going to all these different sites because there's no like immediate replacement to go to. Um, and so it's always good to like seek those folks out if you miss their content or uh, miss chatting with them or what have you. And I guess in the interim, uh, the other thing I would just say is, and I'm kind of a proponent of this, if you don't have either like your own website like it's always good to have some sort of like email or what have you as like a contact system both just as like a reference to others and also to sometimes even just to like conduct like commission stuff because i know that um yes that's something i've tried to do as much as possible because i don't trust like for affinity's note system or like my twitter dms and so i think this is just like another reminder that um, sometimes we have to also like proactively fall back on the most secure systems we have so that if something does suddenly go under, 
um, than we know um, and have already put in place a plan to like protect ourselves. Because at the end of the day, we all have to look out for ourselves. Uh, these companies are not uh, unfortunately going to care much uh, what happens to our accounts or where we end up having to go because their focus is on money, not the user experience. So no, yeah, that's something uh, you mentioned, like using email for commissions is something that I've definitely be, been thinking about, uh, especially since with the Fern uh thing, because I did use uh, yeah. notes as the primary way to to uh, get commissions, right? And yeah. it was a very disheartening couple of days of, of where like I had the finished product, but I, I couldn't send them over to the client because the we whole yeah. website was down. And yeah. so yeah, using email, trying, and definitely thinking about how, how one can like, not this I, I guess not to centralize itself because even even through email we're all using uh we're, most of us are using gmail and that's just yeah another monopoly but uh yeah at least distance ourselves from these web pages that are so fra fragile i guess yeah yeah no i completely agree uh, well, very, very cheery topic of conversation, but um, I know that we have some audience questions as well that I wanted to make sure we made time to get to. Um, and um, the first question we have is from other side and other side. It's it's this is kind of relate to something we were talking about earlier. Uh, so other side asks, let's say you have an art friend that you suspect has a transformation alternative account that you haven't been told of, but you've stumbled upon. Would you be willing to ask your friend if this alt account is theirs and why or why not? Um, so I don't know if who would like to answer that first. <laughs> I would. Oh, I found your thing. Really looks like your art. You sure that's not yours? Come on, you don't have to hide it. I mean, if you're ashamed about it, here's the. Re he I make this shit. Like it's so easy. If you're if, if you have a friend like that and you are already into the stuff, I see like very little risk in asking them. If they freak out over being asked, then I think they have other problems, and I don't think I'd like mm -hmm. them very much after that. If that's the case. Yeah. I, no, that's fair. <laughs> on, Sorry, on, on on my side, I would I would probably ask them as well, but I would be. Uh, I guess I would try to be like sneaky about it at first, like mm -hmm. following them and liking their stuff and maybe hoping that like th they notice that I'm like there too. So we can approach the conversation with like, I guess more of an even, not an even footing, but more of like, we both know of each other's stuff before yeah. we get to the discussing. But I know for sure that if like, one of my IRL f friends somehow stumbled into my transformation stuff. I would love them for them to to come to me about it, to talk about it. Uh, yeah. As I've I've mentioned before, I am very uh, at the moment keeping uh, my R IRL stuff separate, but I do find a great joy in talking about Jeff. So mm -hmm. I think we really awesome and maybe it's something that happens in the future in a, to actually be able to talk more freely with more friends about it right no i i agree i also would honestly ask um because i mean hey if if they don't want to end up in the end talking about it and they denied or whatever then i'd say okay that's fine but yeah. i definitely would bring it up because i'd be like oh you like this thing too i mean he, he, my stuff's all here i'm curious uh if, if you're into it the same way that i am but um yeah i think like especially like if i had noticed something like that i'd also i'd al also want to like check if it was the same person because if not i'd be like wow someone's like imitating your style like to an absurd degree but also in my interest like that's that's interesting let's if it's not actually you i'd be i think that's also an interesting conversation <laughs> so um yeah i think i think that would be something that i would i would bring up as well um uh, we have a second question from bolus and so bolus says uh, there are many factors you have to consider when it comes to becoming an animal species, such as living in a human centric environment like houses and cities or living in the wild, like, you know, the trade offs of having access to vet care versus total freedom. 
If you had a choice over what species you'd become in an impending TF, what factors would matter the most to you in terms of choosing a uh, species or what have you? I would think about whether I can be kept in just an apartment, pretty much. If I could be kept in an apartment, mm -hmm. and that would be easy to hide if hiding was something that I needed to do, then yeah, those things. Generally those. Uh, oh yeah, and um, and not being too sensitive to climate. Because places mm -hmm. that I live typically have four different seasons. There can be very extreme weather. And if I have to worry about having very, very particular needs, I would be really on edge. So if I could consider those things uh, in anticipation to narrow down my choices, then yeah, sure. Also lifespan. I don't want to get stuck into anything that uh, will live only like three days, like an atlas moth or some bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So you, you'd be leaning more towards those comforts of uh, living somewhere uh, in civilization. Well, yeah, especially since what am I going to know about being out there as the thing, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, that's fair. <laughs> I, I, I definitely lean towards that side as well. Like, especially mm. thinking uh, like in that being in civilization, I guess, implies uh of course when we think about animals in houses they're like pets so like being taken care of and having a, a base level of comfort right mm -hmm. yeah and yeah that's definitely where my mind goes to when thinking of what i would like in that scenario yeah i i think at least on my end so i lean a little bit more towards like animals that could exist within both spaces Ooh. in the sense of i personally i bristle at the thought of being a pet uh, maybe this is just like my like fiercely independent streak but um i'm not that kind of a a person of wanting to be one and i would be willing to take my chances elsewhere but um i think especially if like this is something i like have time to plan for i would probably tell like people i know like what it is i might be becoming so that maybe i you know if, if things are really you know i can't cut it out in the wild then maybe i can like scurry back or whatever and be like oh yeah it's that it's zilla's the whatever that is it must be because they're like you know writing on the glass or something i don't know <laughs> um so i i think i would i would want to have something that could maybe exist in both spaces um and i guess when i when i say that i mean things that come to mind from my perspective are like you know, like raccoons or skunks or even like squirrels. Um, I don't know if any of those actually have terribly good lifespans as to your point, Libra, but um, I think I would probably like lean more towards that side of things so that like if I wanted to, maybe I could actually hack it in the wild. But if I'm like, you know, completely in over my head, then I can just run back to my friends and be like, take me in. I'm I'm this raccoon that's like, you know, <laughs> spelling things out. So um yeah, that would be where where I would land. So <laughs> um, I, I I it might be a difference in, in region, but when you first mm -hmm. talked about an animal that could live kind of like in both it's probably because I live in a metropolitan area, but it, uh, the first th thing that came to mind was a pigeon. Oh yeah, <laughs> pigeons a very good choice. Um, I, I think I think pigeons. I mean, they're they're everywhere here yes. too. Um, they're they're adorable and lovely, and I don't trust people who don't like pigeons. Um, to be completely frank, I like them a lot, and uh, they've gone through a lot, and we have not treated them very well, so they deserve yes. all of the love. Um, so yeah, I would I would definitely say that. Um, I think uh, now that you mentioned it, I think the one thing that's like more of a geography based thing, but actually could work because I, I remember running into them quite a bit in Rio is uh, there's a decent amount of monkeys. Around. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was something that I was like, what this is. And they were like, yeah, this is normal. Why are you like freaking out? And I was like, mm, but, you know, meanwhile, my Brazilian relatives freaked out when they saw squirrels. So, you know, I'm going <laughs> to yeah. I'll keep that in mind when I get mocked next time. But um, yeah, like the the amount of like monkeys are around is like it's a very normal thing there. And it's like, well, that that is something that would actually work in technically both both contexts. True. Although, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, it'd, it'd be a bit of a stretch, but it would kind of maybe work. <laughs> 
Oh, man. Um, but yeah, and then uh, the last question I have here again is from other side. And the question is, uh, what was the most formative website for your interest in transformation art that also influenced your art the most? Transfer. It, yeah, was, I think transfer. it was transfer for me too. <laughs> I forgot the name of the site that it was like solid ass Ranzab and I think Kuma. Mm. They, those three shared a, just a simple website together, to post some of their stuff. Mm. But um, yeah, transfer had at the time some really great artists and um, yeah, that's that's where I really remember feeling like oh yeah th there's a thing in the way that I like it and I'm looking for it and and also in new ways that I got to find out about yeah I yeah I th go ahead no I, I never had the pleasure of, of going to transfer I think for me the the answer to this would be funny and funnily enough uh, DeviantArt because oh interesting if, if I remember correctly it's through DeviantArt that I found uh, a lot of like what we've been talking about like character tf a lot of human transformations i remember seeing uh several photo manip artists with uh ah. with like toys and and texture transformations of people being petrified or mm -hmm. roboticized and that uh definitely left a mark yeah, I uh, I definitely know those kinds of artists that you're talking about because uh, I definitely saw a lot of that stuff on DeviantArt back in the day too, and um, yeah, there's there were some really good photo manips there. Uh, it's unfortunate that DeviantArt has been very much like hollowed out. I think in terms of like what's kind of left there now, but um, back in the day, it was definitely a very interesting and subversive space at times to see in terms of art and such. And I do miss that element too. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think for me, definitely like transfer as well in terms of my uh, influence and style. And um, there was a past guest on uh, on the podcast, uh, Foxy, who used to run her own website and uh, that I spent a lot of time on too. Um, her website yeah. was a banger and I appreciated it a lot. Um, and uh, I'll also mention that, uh, you know, it's more of like a recent creation um, pre-created from like past iterations, but I know that uh, uh, Anchor Boda and ABCD run their own website now as well that has a lot of great content that I am a fan of. And some of it is, you know, archived stuff from older periods and some of it is brand new. So um, I always appreciate when artists go to the way to try and make a website in this day and age because uh, it's not easy, um, but it definitely has the ability of, you know, allowing folks to control their own spaces. So yes, yeah. Awesome. Well, that was all the questions that I had. I don't know, Clau, if you had any questions for us. Um, I think, I don't know how, how often you, you guys do, do this, but uh, it's definitely something that I wondered because I, I mm -hmm. didn't have the opportunity to listen to a whole ton of episodes. Though, curiously enough, I did stumble on, upon you guys uh, uh, before being invited over. Uh, it's mm -hmm. how how you c came up with the uh, podcast, maybe, since like yeah, I, I guess Sorry, I guess connecting to, I think my issue of like getting myself out there in terms of mm -hmm. transformation, I think it's very cool that you guys have like a platform for discussions of topic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, personally speaking, I've been someone who's been interested in the format of podcasts for a good long time. Um, I always found them to be very interesting. And in particular, a lot of the podcasts that I listened to at the time and still do, uh, just to a lesser degree, because I have less time, um, they were news based uh, podcasts. So things like The Daily from The New York Times and Today Explained from from Vox. Um, and so one of the things that I thought was really interesting about those kinds of podcasts is they'd have like a new topic every week, they'd have maybe like new guests or what have you. And I always found them informative and like interesting discussions, particularly when they like focused on one person or one thing. And so one of the things I w really wanted to do was to make a podcast um, for the transformation community, because we're such a large space. And it always struck me as strange mm -hmm. that there wasn't some sort of like a recurring almost like weekly sort of podcast like at all there was just like nothing there there had been people who had tried before and had put out some content and some who 
still did some from time to time, but it was pretty infrequent. And I just really felt that, you know, we should really be able as a community to have at least one that does that kind of a thing. Um, so I spent some time listening to older podcasts like Double Helix from like Anger Boda, ABCD and folks like that. And then um, initially I, I started working on this uh, with some other folks uh, and that was season one. Uh, and then things got a little bit complicated and then I continued doing it solo in season two before um, Libra started joining me in season three on a consistent basis. So um, it's been a very interesting journey for the uh, podcast, but um, I think one of the things that uh, both fed into its creation and also keeps it going is that interest inherently that both Libra and I share in terms of learning more from people's perspectives as to why they're into the things that they're into and why they create the art that they create. Because this community mm -hmm. has so many different artists and so many different perspectives. I feel like it's almost limitless. And so there's always different ways to approach topics and different ways to talk about things that I think uh, lends itself well to the podcasting format. Yes. It builds community to make sure that people can have a conversation that started or maybe bullhorn even or something like that or just to have somebody else's uh perspective even if it's just us i mean how are you supposed to think about anything if you only got your circle and i yeah. i don't ever think that's really great to just stick to a very small group of people with this or most things really yeah that, awesome that makes a lot of Sorry. sense no I, thank you for answering i guess yeah no of course um and um yeah i think it's just it's always been an exciting sort of project to engage with and we uh continue to hope making more uh i mean we've made more than 100 episodes so i think we're uh we've definitely hit our stride at this point in terms of production yeah. and such um but yeah uh thank you so much for coming on i really appreciated uh, like having you and uh, getting to talk about all of these different topics. Um, if folks are looking for you online, where can they find you? Yes, uh, as I've mentioned, I have both a Fur Affinity and a Blue Sky. At the moment, these are the only spaces where you can find me. I, I am thinking about expanding elsewhere uh, in the sense of having my own website. Not exactly it. I am thinking of making maybe my own Neo Cities. We'll see, mm. but you can find me uh, on both spaces I just mentioned at at Clara Clow, uh, K L A R A K L A K L A O. Mm -hmm. So, if you enjoy human transformation, if you enjoy an animate transformation, uh, check me out. Awesome, and and uh, thank you for having me. I, yeah, absolutely. And I want to say, did you have any? Uh, Parting words of wisdom in Portuguese for our audience. Vai cagar, filho da puta, Elon Musk. <laughs> yes, take that to the bank. If you don't know what was said, you should look it up. I guarantee you'll, you'll agree. Um, thank you so much again for coming on. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. Um, I hope that y'all had uh, as much fun listening to it as we did recording it. Um, and of course, just like the smiling friends, everyone should go to Brazil. Uh, and if not, at least they should keep an open mind and continue to stay TFE. So if you do come to Brazil, come in, uh, in winter, at least that's, that's my recommendation. Yes. In, in Brazil's winter, not, not yes, exactly. Northern hemisphere's winter. <laughs> exactly. Come in your summer, take a summer vacation yes. to Brazil. It'll be the same temperature, suddenly. <laughs> I don't mind that. It'll at least be prettier. <laughs> yes, it will be. <laughs>